Hello, welcome back to Character Day. Um, we have over 200,000 groups around the country and world participating, all 50 states. It's been an incredible day of discussion. People are watching films, people are sharing advice online, which has been like my favorite thing. I'm learning so much good advice. And we even learned about the research of advice by Angela Duckworth. And in this new episode of programming, episode four, we have one of my favorite people, Krista Tippett from On Being. Give us like two or three highlights of your day so far, or best pieces of advice that you've heard. Oh, two or three highlights from the day so far. Oh, well, we just did an amazing um, discussion with uh, two people. That one runs a program called No One Eats Alone for schools and a no bullying program. And we were talking just about bullying in terms of larger kind of ideas in society. Um, I, know, I found that so moving. And so I think uh, thinking about teaching empathy and compassion and different perspectives, the fact that it's elevated and highlighted in schools and society, I'm so grateful. That was not the way it was like when I was going to school. I don't think people had a word for it. Um, so anyways, I'm super excited. People are watching movies. Um, they're having discussion. And they're tapping into this at their events and online. So welcome all the new viewers if you're just joining us or if you've seen the several other uh, episodes before us. So our, uh, our next session coming up, we have Krista Tippett. We're also going to talk about screen time and self-regulation with two amazing women who run programs in schools about limiting cell phone use. You guys all know I'm into that. We're going to talk about positive Judaism. Um, and we're also going to talk about from Sandy Hook tragedy to social emotional learning um, with Scarlett Lewis. So it's an amazing um, group of interviews coming up. And so now I'm going to introduce the fabulous, amazing Krista Tippett. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, on being. I, I have to just say that in a society that has become so noisy, I love what you bring is deep listening generous listening I, and so intimate. Like, I haven't seen you. I miss you, by the way. Hi. I know. Hello. <laughs> it's so nice I'm to see you. I'm glad to be here. But I also feel like I'm with you all the time in my car in a very intimate, deep, profound way. And I know people feel that way with you. Um, so I just feel like it's this incredible counter counteraction to all the distraction and noise is the fact that podcasts are so popular and yours I find the most intellectually stimulating one. So if you haven't yet heard Krista Tippett's on being run don't walk to your uh, nearest uh, podcast and um, and I also I had the great honor of being interviewed by her which I was thinking it's like intellectual tango when you interviewed me. <laughs> I've never been interviewed quite like that. Like you asked me all these questions and then you kind of delivered this insight that I had never thought about, about my work mm. and thank you. And um, I just feel like you're such an incredible voice right now in these pretty divisive days to remind us what matters and to think deeply about philosophy and science and kindness and poetry and all these things that unite us. So first, just thank you. Always. Well, I'm so happy to finally be part of Character Day. <laughs> I know last year we had we had some technical difficulties. It was very funny. We had, yes. <laughs> but I played our conversation. It was like one of those moments. I'm like, well, it's not working, but let's just play our interview. And actually, people really love that. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> so now I get you live. Yeah. Uh, okay. So first, he wrote an amazing book called Becoming Wise. Um, and you know, always there's a process of kind of writing the book and then talking about it. And what insights, since the book came out several years ago, or was it two years ago? Was it two or three years ago? Um, that, it was two years ago. Yeah. yeah. So what insights have you had about wisdom and just as you've been going around with the book, and, I'm, and I know you're working on something new, but do you have any insights from that journey? I think uh, one of the interesting things was just what wisdom is. Um, and I, I, I wrote the book without ever defining wisdom and mm. so that was a question people start I mean of course it was 200 pages about it but <laughs> um, when when people started asking me you know what is wisdom in one sentence I started to realize that you know uh, it, uh, distinct from knowledge or intelligence or accomplishment which are things we kind of know how to define and, and of course a wise person can have knowledge and they can have accomplishment but I think the measure of a wise life is the effect, the imprint it makes on other lives around it, right? Mm. And I think we can all think of the 
the wisest people we've known close to home and and that's and that is what that is what will come to us and and so you know that has really become important image for me how this is something this is embodied right and it's also about its character embodied right and then it's 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 the lived experience of what happens um hmm. the the way you affect others around you and the world around you in that and so that i don't know i think that's felt important i love to that ponder. well yeah. you know yeah that's so beautiful because we the the question we're asking everyone every year we ask a question was what's the best piece of advice you've received and it, first of all it's been so delicious to see everyone passing around this wisdom but then I was speaking with Angela Duckworth, um, who you know does all this interesting research on character, and she said, "Oh, I just finished just finished a report about advice, and sharing mm. advice, which is wisdom, is it's a gift to even ask someone to think of it, because the very yeah. act itself is prompting them to recall a piece of wisdom. So it was this wonderful. I just loved that it, you really think of it. It's not just passing on wisdom, but it helps everyone. It helps everyone. It's all interdependent, as we all know. Um, yeah. But I love that embodied character. It's beautiful. Um, you once said, I love your use of words, and you once said, I don't remember which thing we were at or I was listening to, but you talked about kindness, and you said, that you've always felt like it was a more muscular word than people use. Can you talk about mm. that a little? Mm. Yeah, you know, it's one of these words that makes its way onto bumper stickers, and it, and it it sounds kind of easy and kind of squishy, but if you think of every great virtue, um, kindness is implied in it. And and what I also like about kindness, unlike some of the more complicated things like courage or compassion or love. Um, Kindness is something you can extend in a moment, and actually, uh, kindness is a, is has instantaneous gratification. You know, and now there is actually science around that when people extend kindness, uh, you know, buy a cup of coffee for the person in the car behind them, it sets off this chain reaction. And so I just I feel like it's it's care it's virtue that we can bring into the most uh, mundane, ordinary aspects of our days with strangers as well as with people we know and love. Mm. Uh, and we should tell you that more, that muscle, that power. Mm, I love that. I love that because we, you know, we call our films to be Let It Ripple. So I was just had this beautiful visual of just the kindness ripple. And... Oh, Tiffany, I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Let's see if my team... Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, I was just saying I love this idea of the kindness ripple. Um, our mm. film studio is called Let It Ripple. We just love the idea of how things can ripple out. And you know, I feel like, oh, while well, there's so much conversation about kindness and empathy and compassion on the one hand, on the other hand, we have probably the most difficult language being thrown around since I've been alive in our society. Mm. And um, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about your Civil Conversations Project. It feels like a solve to the situation. <laughs> yeah, well, so one thing I feel, I'm more and more distinguishing between the official discourse, which is what you're talking about, right? The, the public spectacle of uh, dysfunctional and emotional and hateful and actually really counterproductive uh, conversation or lack of, and how we reduce really important human questions to two sides. And then we let the most extreme positions on both sides frame conversation. And it feels to me, again, a power that we all have in our lives, in our daily lives. Oh, you know what, Krista? Mm. We're hearing that your voice just started breaking up. I don't know if it's the connection of. Are you in your audio booth? I'm, I am, but I'm hearing um, some other conversation happening. Oh. You're hearing that. I don't kind want us to, like, I don't want our, our <laughs> audio, you're like audio person. I don't know, normally I, bad, bad, bad karma. normally I hear you so clearly, I'm hearing every other word suddenly. Oh, well listen, um, yeah. that's unfortunate, but you know, Character Day, it has grown so big, it's, it, we have to just kind of go with the flow on the tech, it happens. So we're doing something that hasn't really been done of linking together these various parts of the world through it. Okay, try one more. Just say one sentence. Uh, what you ate for uh, breakfast? 
Let me see. Uh, eggs. Oh, it's, it's a little it's broken. Go. Oh. Oh. oh, there's someone oh. in my background as well. Oh, well, huh. Okay. Well, that makes me sad, but I loved even the five minutes I got with clear audio with Krista Tippett. Um, was so lovely. Um, yeah. Oh, you're there now. I know. I was hearing something. Now I can hear like you. Second channel going on at the same time. Sounds now like you Tiffany was. Oh, you sound amazing now. Oh. Okay. Well, I have you on audio. Can other people? Okay. Can other people hear her on audio for a yeah, second? Just try it. Okay. So that's, I am going to. Ask, that's okay. Well, I want to just have you close. With we've been asking all the speakers, what's the best piece of advice you've been given? So if you could share that as our closing, and you're just on audio. Um, sure. Great. Are you there, Krista? Here. The third oh. arm, right? Oh, yeah, and I can see you, too. Okay. Are we? Yeah. So perhaps give us your best piece of advice you've received. Oh, okay. Me. A best piece of advice that came to me that's related to what we were discussing is uh, oh. I've always had who are older, much older. I always had women in their 80s. I love that. And I love that. You know, I don't know that broke yeah. up a little, but I know what you're saying, and I loved it for your gather yeah. from your gathering too. But always have friends of different friends. ages. I love yes. that. You, you know, you had a whole panel on that at the On Being gathering, and I've thought a, I actually yeah. made an effort with Sylvia Borstein, who was at. <laughs> we had her over for Shabbat, and she's like my new friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. I. It's, but, Thank you so much, Chris. I'm sorry that we ran into a little audio thing, but even five minutes with you was like a complete gift. I love seeing you. I'd love to get back in touch. I will we'll make that happen. Thank you, Krista. Thank you for all the work you do. Okay. Oh. We're going to an exciting event. We're going to an exciting event. Mackenzie Darling here. Where are we going to? Hello, everybody. Hold on. Let me just get. You got to unplug and let. Okay. Nope, you're fine. Stand right there. Okay. I think we're good to go. So we are going live to Sarasota Military Academy with Todd Brown, one of our favorites. Oh my gosh! Todd. I know we weren't even expecting it, Wait, and this happened? is super How surprise. It and it's happening. They're having a flash mob. Um, so leave it to Todd Brown to be totally creative and awesome the way he celebrates these global oh events. My Todd, can you hear me? There is a hi. Come over there. Hello. Hi. Hey, hey, how are you doing? Oh. Wonderful. We're, uh, we're Minds. Uh, let, hey, just wing it, right? Yes, it winging it up. That's yep. what character day. We're tapping in all of. We are so happy. To, I have to just say for a second, Todd Brown is I, one of the most inspiring educators. Like everything he does for our global events is amazing. Thank you. So what what do you have in store for us right now? <laughs> uh, well, so we we had this idea. Uh, we celebrate character day like crazy every year, uh, as you know. Uh, and we had this idea, Captain Fontecha, who was absolutely amazing. Uh, she is doing bravery. So I said, you know what? Uh, Sarah Bareilles' uh, Brave song in the video is hilarious and amazing. So let's recreate it. And Captain Fontecha and SMA Prep is, uh, they're letting us do it, which is fantastic. <laughs> hey, if you're a teacher, if you're a teacher, come here, because it's amazing. Uh, so we are going to uh, fire up uh, Brave. Uh, and we have our flash mob and other dancers, and I have no idea. So I'm so this excited. Is <laughs> yes, let's so, do it, Todd. Are we We're ready. Woohoo! Okay. okay, good. Ready? Let's go. I love Todd. <laughs> Sarasota Military Academy in Florida. <laughs> I love this. Oh my God. <laughs>
right? That is so, so fun. Oh my God. And I love that he's incorporating bravery into dance because it takes a lot of guts to get out there and shake your moves, right? <laughs> exactly. And do they have like a drone? I just noticed the camera like flew over the kids. Todd kiss. Brown always has a drone. He always has backups. He comes prepared. Oh my God. Oh, this is great. <laughs> You make Military Academy look really fun. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh my God, they're dancing. Whoa, what's happening? <laughs> We've got some ballet, 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 ballet going on. <laughs> he's still there with the music on. <laughs> I wanted to say that Todd actually got this song. I know it's a little difficult to hear, but um, he actually had this song specifically made um, yeah. for his Inspire project and for his students. Oh, it's amazing, amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're so yeah, great. Uh, that is just, yay! You yeah, get, thanks. I think that's off to you, Todd. That was so good. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Todd. We love you. We love you, Todd. <laughs> you got me all choked up. I was crying. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Amazing. Oh, okay. That was so great. Okay. <clears throat> oh, my goodness. That was amazing. Um, okay. We're going to start in a sec. And I'm going over here. That was so great. Um, <laughs> watching a flash mob for Character Day about bravery, I don't know if it gets much better than that. But I am now going to be joined by two incredible women who are bringing much needed self awareness and awareness to your children's use of technology. Uh, Delaney Rustin and Brooke Shannon are incredible. Delaney is an award winning filmmaker and she leads research on how technology impacts today's teens. And Brooke Shannon is the founder of Wait Till Eighth as in wait till eighth grade to get your kid a smartphone. I'm all for this. We waited till our daughter was 15 years old and I think it was the best decision we ever made. And we were kind of outliers. We were like the only ones who did that. And then when I heard about Brooke, she's got a whole campaign that you can sign and learn more about. So I'd like to welcome them both to Character Day. Oh, yay. Hello. Hello. I'm so happy to be talking to you both together. Um, Okay, first, just to start, um, you know, so much of uh, character, you know, there's 24 character strengths that we talk about with all of our work and our films about character development, and one of them is self-regulation. And then there's a whole bunch of strengths I can think that relate to this, but let's just focus on self-regulation for a second. Why don't you each talk about, uh, just briefly, your programs that you're working on, Away for the Day and Wait Till Eighth. So Delaney, do you want to go first? Yeah. You know, as a physician, I've been really interested on the impact of screen time on youth and as a mother about how do we help parents to um, help their kids regulate around how much youth they're going to be using. And it's not easy. Um, in Screenagers, it's been a film that looks at my struggle to get better at doing this and many different stories. And out of the work of screenagers, which still screens in a, in a lot of schools and other places, um, I started seeing how schools were allowing cell phones into younger and younger grades in a way that I had to look at the research. And looking at the research, I found that for social emotional development, what we're talking about here today at Character Day, particularly for middle schools, having phones put away for the day is really a benefit to students, as well as their academic performance. Yeah. So I, for this, 
okay. we started yeah, awayfortheday.org, which is all about empowering parents and teachers and counselors to be able to go on the website and to have all sorts of policies, um, all sorts of ways to go to their schools if the school doesn't have a way for the day and change schools. And this is happening across the country where schools are changing their policies to be in line with what parents want, which is for students not to be using their phones. We've done surveys on this. And what the research shows is most effective for their social, emotional, and academic. Yeah, it's so wonderful. I'm realizing I'm wearing a beret today. And so that made me think of France, which just banned mm -hmm. cell phones, smartphones, in all of the schools. It's the big away for the country program. So I, that was the most exciting thing when it happened. It was like, yes, yes, you know, yes, we're all using technology. It's here to stay. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to have a supercomputer in your pocket ready to distract you every second when you're in school, because that can't be good for anyone. So I was so happy when they did that. And then, Brooke, please tell us about your amazing pledge, Wait Till 8th. Well, the Wait Till 8th pledge is a pledge that helps parents come together with other parents to delay when their children get a smartphone. And it really just started out as a local initiative in Austin, I was noticing in my own daughter's elementary school that they were starting to get smartphones at such a young age. You know, kids were coming to school with the latest iPhone in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and it just was really getting out of hand. And so as a community, we came together and decided to band together as a group of parents and delay when we give our kids a smartphone. You know, we came together around the age of eight. And from that, it just quickly grew across the country. I think it resonated with so many parents because there's so many other parents out there that want to wait, but they feel this pressure in their community to get their kid a phone because they don't want their kid to be isolated and they're only without one. So it really helps to have this community coming together to hold off on the technology. Yeah, I, that's what I love is there's so much peer pressure <clears throat> from the parent community. and. As we all know, so much of parenting is modeling behavior. And um, what I love about both of your initiatives is it's gathering a whole community of support. Because I think it's one of those things, like instinctively, <clears throat> I would say most parents are worried about it. And they're just not like, what do we do? There's not, a, there's not enough of a posse to make this happen. And what both of your initiatives do is make the school, give them the tools to take the initiative with away for the day, and then wait till 8th. They're just rolling this out in our school at Park Elementary School. And I'm so excited. And I really feel like there's going to be a groundswell. Um, you know, I make a lot of films about neuroscience. And uh, my new one's going to be on the adolescent brain. And just there are times when you don't want to do as much um, distraction and influencing the development. And I think that all the research is just backing up what we all intuitively know. And um, you know, my family and I, we unplug one day a week and we've done it for nearly a decade and it's been the, the best practice of my life. And I think what we're all, I think, saying is that technology's here, but what kind of character strengths can we uh, introduce and, and support around our kids and ourselves to create a more healthy environment? So I think the social media component is obviously very big in all of this. I know a lot of people would say to me when we didn't get our daughter a smartphone, oh, she's going to be left out of all this social stuff. And it, it just didn't happen. And I think what mm -hmm. people forget is that kids are very resourceful. And also, even if a child doesn't have a smartphone, they're still on their computer and have access to things. It's not like they're not on technology. So what kind of um, character strengths do you think that each of your programs is really, really grappling with? Well, I think for in schools, you know, there's a lot that we can be doing to foster kids in terms of their relationships, right? Relationships with teachers, with other peers, with students who are older or younger, ideally in some mentoring capacities. When kids are naturally prone to something like a video game, because let's say they get the competency feel of leveling up, or kids, for example, are nervous about interacting with other kids. All of these reasons make them want to go and hide in the library with their phone. 
they're not bad they're not wrong but i'm not sure can you hear me i'm not sure i can hear you if i can oh, hear great. you yeah so we really want to have the focus um not be this all about the phones go away yes the phone should go away but then we want the main point is that we're really encouraging improvement in communication and relationship skills. And schools are a wonderful place for us to do that. Mm, I love that. And Brooke, talk to us. I love what you write about play, being outside and away from the screen. Can you talk a little bit of the importance of play? I just think that play is so important for children. And because of how culture has developed over the past, you know, a few decades, the kids are having less opportunity for play. Um, their schedules are completely overstructured, while at the same time, any moment that they have as like a down moment is um, being sucked away with the presence of screens. This constant, like our kids can't be bored mentality. When in actuality, boredom is really good for our kids. Like we want our kids to experience boredom because boredom pushes them to create, to imagine, to problem solve, okay. to meet new so people. Me, and so uh, it's really important for our children to have these moments of boredom. And when you give them a smartphone, especially at such a young age, um, you're really giving them this little device that's just a boredom killer. And they're not having the opportunities for play and um, unstructured time, just their friends without the presence of the screen. I love it. OK. I. I I have only a minute left and I want to, well, first of all, I want everyone to know, like, where do they go? To, I want everyone, we have 200,000 groups listening and over 15,000 schools. How do they find out? Why don't you each say how they can find out about the pledge and away for a day? Okay, well, so well, for a wait until eight. Oh, sorry. I should have said for Go ahead. <laughs> women are always so polite. Delaney, you go first. Um, people can get tons of resources on how to make changes in schools at awayfortheday.org and to join the movement around screenagers which has lots of resources about character development parenting and screen time they go to screenagersmovie.com yes and she writes an amazing um, weekly newsletter that's so wonderful and Brooke how can people sign this pledge it's really easy if you're interested in bringing this to your school. It's a parent-led movement. So all you have to do is go to waituntil8th.org and you can sign the pledge there. We have all types of resources to um, encourage you on how to spread it in your community and get the word out um, with parents at your school and in your neighborhood. Wonderful. I am so grateful for both of your work and I'm so glad that we're all talking um, I think this is one of the most important issues in society. You know, every era has a new technology. For me, it was like television was going to destroy the brain. I think there's like a period where we overdo it on the pendulum and we swing back. And I'm really glad that this conversation is happening and that there's some movement for change. So thank you both for your work. And I hope we'll work together to kind of spread all of this. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany, for all you do to make bring us all together. It's really incredible. Thank and Brooke, you. wonderful to be with you again. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Who do we have next? There's all these like so many this is really like a fantasy for me today because it's all of my favorite people that I want to talk to and I get to have I wish I could talk to them longer. But um, I'm so happy that I get to just touch into their thoughts around such important topics. The next person we're talking to is Rabbi Darren Levine. And, um, you know, when I first learned about character, um, you know, I'm Jewish, and uh, I felt like a very bad Jew when the film came out, The Science of Character, and all these Jewish educators were like, why didn't you mention Musar? There's an old Jewish practice about character development, and I had never heard of it before, so I felt. The rabbi told you yesterday there's no such thing as a bad Jew. Right. The rabbi told me there's no such thing as a bad Jew. My, in another interview. <clears throat> but anyway, so then we made a film, The Making of a Mensch. And what's so interesting about The Making of a Mensch is there's all these um, interesting thinkers around positive psychology that are Jewish. They also don't mention Musar. So then I get this email one day from Rabbi Darren Levine, who's the founder of positive Judaism, like positive psychology, but positive Judaism. And he writes these amazing sermons and emails about character strengths and Judaism. So I was like, I gotta get this dude on the show, the show of Character Day, and I want to hear what you think. So, hello, Darren. It's so nice to have you here. Hello, Tiffany. 
so great to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in Character Day. Character is super important to Jewish people and also how to make a positive difference in the world. And those two dove together beautifully because people who have strong characters, who are resilient and optimistic, those are the folks who are really making a positive difference in the world. They're bringing their character forward. And I know that's super important to you. Oh, thank you. Now I don't feel like a bad Jew anymore. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So for, <laughs> um, why don't you say, how did you first, like, were you, were you always interested in Judaism and positive psychology? Or what was, like, the inner mesh for you? Well, a long time ago, I figured out that seminary, while it's so important in terms of five years of training to be a rabbi, didn't train me in some very important tools about how to serve people and how to raise their level of happiness and well-being. And so I went back to graduate school to study psychology. And when we were there, we were introduced to a whole series of books written by Marty Seligman and others on positive psychology. And one day it just clicked for me and a light bulb went off, which was there's so much about Judaism in well-being and happiness, and it seemed that there was a natural intersection between the two fields. And then I had my own personal day where I um, happened to have been in a, in a car accident here in New York on my way to visit somebody in the hospital, and I um, was sending someone a gift. It happened to have been a child in our congregation and on my way to the hospital, I got hit in a taxi. And, and the two things just became really more important to me on that day. And rather than turn to Jewish prayer and Jewish text to help me overcome that tragic day in my own life, I went to my bookshelf. And all of those books on positive psychology and positive thinking and resilience just left off my bookshelf into my hands. And that was really the day that positive Judaism was born. And so I started talking about it in my congregation and giving sermons about that topic. And then people started saying, this seems to be something here. Write more, blog more, podcast more. <laughs> and then you and I became connected and one thing led to another. And <laughs> here, we, here are. we are. Here we are. I love that. I love that. Well, it's interesting because Marty Seligman, who has been uh, a speaker for Character Day for several years, I've brought it up to him, like, do all the Jews in positive psychology, like, do they go, oh, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> We're all kind of from the same background here, but it doesn't come up as much as you would think. Um, but I, you know, I was thinking a lot in Yom Kippur. We've just been through high holidays. Um, and I was thinking a lot how Yom Kippur is really, I mean, Character Day is like a secular version of Yom Kippur because we have people of all faiths joining us today or people, atheists, wherever you come from, this is the day to talk about meaning and pur purpose and working on yourself. And um, that Yom Kippur, the older I get, the more profound. And for those of you that don't know, Yom Kippur is this very, uh, my favorite holiday and it's the deepest holiday where you really think about working on yourself and what you've done wrong, who you need to apologize to, who you need to ask for forgiveness from and what you want to work on in the coming year. So, I mean, do you, I know you wrote an incredible piece, but talk to us a little bit about the practice itself of that we're a work in progress is really embedded sure. in, in Judaism. Well, the whole idea is that, I mean, speaking about Yom Kippur, which is a profound day on the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. It is the day of becoming at one with oneself. And this whole idea of personal growth and deepening character strength is so important. And we talk about that in our congregation. And the idea of spending a day at a time when people often fast, meaning they don't eat, and they restrict themselves from a lot of the elements of the material world, and they just reflect on their own lives and what they want to get out of it in the year ahead. And forgiveness, like you said, is a big part of that. And forgiveness is a really good example of how the science of positive living and Judaism intersect. So we know that people who have that strength of forgiveness and are able to forgive easily they scale higher in well-being surveys than others. Mm. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. And the secret is, is that in the scale of the, 
VIA characteristics and strengths, of all those characteristics like resilience and hope, spirituality, forgiveness is one of them. Forgiveness is one of my lowest ranking strengths. Hmm. And you think that would be ironic for a rabbi to have forgiveness <laughs> as a lowest ranking strength. I was trying to think but as you were saying it. I was thinking, I'm like, is that a, is that a strong thing or I need to work on that? <laughs> well, it's not that I'm not a forgiving person. I'm actually a very forgiving person. In my heart, I find the ability to forgive people. But I just get to it a little differently. I get to it through my other strengths. Like, my, most of my strengths are the cerebral strengths. So getting to forgiveness happens through my thinking strengths and my mental strengths. But the important thing for everyone to know is that somewhere embedded in all of them is the sense of forgiveness. And because we know that forgiveness is such an important thing to be able to forgive and to move on in life and not to hold grudges and not hold the need to feel like we have to revenge the wrongs that were done to us. On Yom Kippur, we're able to let go of those and to, and to start a new year fresh. So that's a good example. And that's why Yom Kippur is such an important and powerful day. I love what you were talking about, about using, you know, Marty Seligman and Peterson broke down the 24 character strengths. And what was so exciting when I right. first discovered that research is just giving a name to it. It's the more, you know, you name it, you can do practices around it, you can figure out what you need to work on. <clears throat> but I like this idea a lot of how different strengths can support other ones that you need to strengthen. So one of the exercises a lot of the schools are doing and companies is they put what's their top strength and one they want to work on in the coming year. But I like this idea of not only what you want to work on, but what other strengths can you call in as Calvary to help you bring up that strength? They're all like these, they're all these tools available to you. And if you need to work on one, which ones are you going to bring in to help lift up and strengthen that strength in you? I think that's really, that's a beautiful idea. I was imagining, yeah, just this keyboard uh, sound level system that we use in the film, but it really, they each support each other. So that's really beautiful. Now, I wish we had more time, but we're, we don't, sadly. But um, we're asking everyone, um, and what we're asking on social media today for Character Day is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? And what's so fun about that is it not only shares a lot of great wisdom, but it really shows something about you to me, about what, you're, what you either value as a character strength or what you're working on. So with that set up, tell me your best piece of advice you've received in your life. I think the best piece of advice I have ever received was from my grandmother, who, when I was a child, would spend a lot of time with me. And she would often say, whenever there was a struggle that I was facing, whenever there was a problem I was facing with my peers, whenever there was a challenge I needed to overcome, whenever I would come home upset or sad about something, my grandmother would always say, Darren, gum ze." Yavor, which is, Darren, this too shall pass, which was the most helpful piece of information, the most helpful and wise thing to say to me, because when you're sitting there faced with a challenge and you're struggling, you need a little wisdom to know that gonna... other people have faced this, you'll get through this, and you'll be just fine. You're perfect like everybody else. Just be patient, and this too shall pass. That's why my dad used to say that to me. My late father, Leonard Slane, always said that to me. This too shall pass. And I do think about that. I hadn't thought about that today, but that's a big one. This too shall pass. And he used to always say, nothing is ever as bad as you think it's going to be. And sometimes things that you think were going to be so, so so great, those are never, they never, the heights and the lows, like, they all pass through. And it's interesting because a lot of Buddhist ideas are about, like, things, you know, things you're anxious about, let them float away, it's going to pass. I feel like there's a link there of just understanding the temperance of, you know, that things are going to come and they're going to go, and you need to really hold that when you're in the depth of being anxious about something. So I'm so glad you brought, what was your grandmother's name? Shirley Costin Levine, a beautiful woman. And you can see <laughs> how important our grandparents are to us. I and love I will that. say things on you know, most grandparents today, they're having such a hard time figuring out where they fit into their grandchildren's lives because grandchildren are so busy 
They're using devices in ways that grandparents can't always connect into because it's a different generation. But grandparents who are out there and watching today, you are so important to mm -hmm. your children's lives and your grandkids. So don't ever forget the importance of your presence and your wisdom. Oh, I'm getting off a quim because my daughter, Ken's and my daughters, they have two wonderful grandmothers that are alive and they spend a lot of time with them and FaceTime and time together and yeah, it's a beautiful thing. I, I actually, I know this is going to sound unusual, but I've always looked for, from a young age, looked forward to being a grandparent. <laughs> I don't know. I just I had this image of myself in this big velvet chair with all my grandchildren, and I don't know. I've I've looked forward to that part of life. I I always have, and my parents used to make oh. fun of me, but there it is. <laughs> um, okay. It's a beautiful. It's, <laughs> well, I'm so I I can't wait. I hope someday I can come visit your congregation and experience live your intersection of you know, positive psychology and Judaism, positive Judaism, and thank you for making the link so beautifully um, in your work and your writing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, next we are going to have Mackenzie Darling back over here. She's going to slide over here. And Hello, you're everyone. Gonna, you're going to interview Scarlett Lewis. I'm really looking forward to this one. Scarlett is absolutely an incredible person. I saw her at South by Southwest last year. Um, there is not a dry eye in the house. She is such a resilient, amazing, and inspiring person. I know. I think I'm going to go in the other room and watch the interview with some Kleenex. Um, no, but it's very inspiring, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward. I, I, you all, I'm sure you'll ask for her, her advice as well. I'm sure she has a lot to teach us. Absolutely. I'm going to read her bio really quick as we are um, firing up here. So, Scarlett Lewis. Um, founded the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Movement after her son was murdered during the Sandy Hook tragedy in December 2012. Shortly after his death, Scarlett decided to be part of the solution to the issues that we're seeing in our society so incredibly widely these days. And that has also caused the tragedy. Um, she created the movement and became an advocate for social emotional learning that teaches children how to manage their emotions, feel connected, and have healthy, healthy relationships. Hello, Scarlett. How are you? It's wonderful to see your face. Oh, it's so good to see you. Thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. So as we were kind of wrapping up um, and introducing you, I was mentioning to Tiffany that we had met at South by Southwest and how incredibly inspiring you were and that there is not a dry eye in the entire audience. Um, so I've been looking forward to reconnecting with you and hearing your crusade to get social emotional learning in every single school in the country. Um, Absolutely. So I guess um, before we start, I think what's so amazing about you is that you've taken such a horrible tragedy and turned it into an inspiration and a movement that could not be more important right now as there are more and more school shootings happening than I care to say. So can you talk a little bit about your journey there? Well, you know, so my six-year-old son, Jesse McCord Lewis, was shot in his first grade classroom alongside 19 of his classmates and six educators and uh, following that day I I realized that I was going to have to be part of the solution and I started researching what that could be and I was so heartened to find that there really is a solution and it's called social emotional learning and um, I I just wondered why with all the decades of research that we have on the benefits including of course reduced anger and bullying and, and violence and better grades and test scores and uh, increased safety um, with all of the uh, beneficial outcomes of social emotional learning. Why wasn't it in every school? And so I, I saw that there were some impediments and just worked with educators to create a program that transcends what we feel are all the issues to getting this into schools. And uh, we called it Choose Love because, of course, that's the most important choice that we make on a daily basis that impacts all our other choices. And uh, we are offering this program right now on our website for free for all educators. 
And uh, in the last two years, it's now being taught in all 50 states and downloaded in over 65 countries. There is definitely a huge need out there. Love is what connects us all as human beings. We all have the want and need to love and be loved. And it's a way for all of us to come together, uh, regardless of what political party uh, you adhere to, regardless on what your opinion is on guns um, or anything else, actually. Uh, regardless of any perceived differences that we have at all, we all have the want and need to love and be loved. And the Choose Love movement is a way for us all to come together to be part of the solution. Thank you so much, Scarlett. I remember um, a really key message of your presentation at South by Southwest is you had this slide behind you that said, forgiveness equals resilience. And you told an incredible, incredible story that still, will, it'll stay with me the rest of my life. Um, what you said at your son's funeral to the people that asked you what, what could they do for you. Can, you. can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely, yeah. So I got up and I spoke at Jesse's funeral. And of course, everybody had been asking, what can we do for you? genuinely wanting to do something for me. And I said, you know, there really is something that you can do. Uh, this whole tragedy started with an angry thought in Adam Lanza's head. Uh, Adam Lanza was the perpetrator of the crime. Uh, his former student of Sandy Hook Elementary School, his mother had taught there. And I pictured Adam as a little boy having angry thoughts without the tools or nurturing environment to deal with those thoughts. Uh, and everything starts with a thought in our head, right here. Anger, joy, our perception of our reality, feelings of loneliness, everything starts with a thought in our head. And when you look at research, uh, scientific research tells us that uh, we all have about 50,000 thoughts a day that go through our head, 70 to 80% of which are negative and do not serve us. And over 95% are repetitive. Uh, and so I asked everyone on that day to please think about what they thought about and to choose one uh, loving thought over an angry thought. So to replace an ang one angry thought every day with a loving thought. And I said, by doing that, you will make yourself feel better. You will positively impact those around you. And through the ripple effect, you will make this a safer, more peaceful and loving world. And so uh, everybody kind of went off to the four corners of the United States, people had flown in from everywhere. And I started getting emails, texts, phone calls about a week later, telling me that that one simple act had completely changed people's lives. It was just bringing this awareness to the forefront and actually that was my original idea for the Choose Love movement. That was the message that I was gonna go out with. Uh, I saw what a huge impact that made on others and I know what a huge impact just that awareness made on my life. But then I got educators involved and they blew the roof off of that whole idea and they created the Choose Love Enrichment Program, which is a pre-K through 12th grade program uh, that's now being taught in all 50 states. And But that, but that thought First of all, I mean, you use the word awareness. Um, it is incredible how much awareness you had in such a deep time of mourning. And to be able to really, um, you know, pay that forward in such a devastating time, I, I again, I applaud you. And um, it has, it's turned into quite a movement. Um, I'd love to hear from you what you would want to see the important changes in schools being made. Can you give maybe like, top one or two things that you think has to be done today, this moment? Yeah, I will. Uh, so right now, every state is working on a statewide school safety initiative. So this is through their director of Homeland Security and governor's office. And of course, when we think of school safety, we traditionally think about external safety measures, right? Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, door locks, active protocol, bulletproof film, single point entry, arming, not arming school resource officers. These are all the conversations that are going on now around the country. But in reality, 
social and emotional learning is the number one way to have a safe school. Mm -hmm. And people go, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, what about all those external safety measures? Well, those external safety measures are incredibly important, but none of those address the cause of why a child wants to harm themselves or others. The only thing really that does that is social emotional learning, teaching kids how to have healthy relationships, deep and meaningful connections, skills and tools for resilience, how to manage their emotions and conflict. Kids with these skills and tools will not want to harm one another. It's cultivating safety from the inside out. If you do not uh, direct attention to the cause, you cannot be talking about a solution. So it is a combination of those things. But I will say that New Hampshire is a courageous leader in the movement to keep our kids safe. Governor Chris Sununu has uh, the first governor to release his statewide school safety report. And he is focusing on social and emotional learning as part of school safety and actually using our program, the Choose Love Enrichment Program, as the backbone of support. So um, I just, I encourage the conversation to continue in other states and for them to kind of take, uh, learn from what Governor Sununu is. This is a brand new conversation, but it's so incredibly important. And it really takes social emotional learning from what I think people consider as a nice to have, oh, if we have time for it, we'll do it, to an absolute essential part of a school day. Absolutely, thank you so much, Scarlett. Um, I could not agree more. We're wrapping up here, but I would love to end with your best piece of advice. And I think that it's really important to end with Jesse's words because your best piece of advice was have a lot of fun. So can you very, very quickly just tell the audience um, the quick story behind the have a lot of fun from Jesse? Absolutely, I'd love to. So JT is Jesse's older brother. He was six years older than Jesse, so he was 12. And after his little brother died, he the first time he went back into his bedroom, he found this little note on his desk. It was all folded carefully and he unfolded it to look at it and it and Jesse had written to him and really his last message to his big brother was have a lot of fun. And uh, it was such a beautiful message, last message from little brother to a big brother. But then I saw that and I thought this message is for all of us because while we are focused on choosing love and all of our choices on a daily basis, love over fear, uh, you're, we need to have a lot of fun. That's like why we were put on earth. Our kids want to have fun. We want to have fun. Pain and suffering come. You don't have to schedule those. Sometimes you find yourself scheduling, doing things that you love to do and having fun. And it's just a great reminder for all of us that, that that's a really important thing to do on a daily basis. I absolutely love you, Scarlett. Thank you so much. And um, let's all have a lot of fun today and tomorrow and the next. Thank you, Scarlett, for being part of us. And I think, uh, Renee, you're coming in to uh, wrap up this episode. So, Hi. yeah, how's it going? What, are you, what did you think of this last session? Any major highlights? Oh, so many. Um, I love, I, I just love the last interview when she said to replace the negative and angry thoughts with one loving thought. I mean, it's such, it seems like such a simple thing to do, but it can be so transformative. I loved that bit of... Uh, of knowledge and to have fun, that wisdom from her son. That was Absolutely. amazing. Absolutely. I really, really loved to um, Krista Tippett talking about having um, friends with different ages, and that, of course, brings the character strengths of perspective in. I also thought um, her piece on wisdom is inspiring others. So it's not bringing knowledge it just within yourself, but to others as well. So we're wrapping up this session and uh, we're coming up next with Resilience and Standing Strong. I will be introducing or interviewing Dr. Sean Stevenson. We'll be talking about building character through um, literature. And then t uh, Tiffany will be talking about her technology Shabbats at 1440 Multi-University. So we'll see you then.